Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. On our latest edition of You Make the Call, you may remember how we do this. I show you two slides. We discuss what the likely diagnosis is, and then we give you the diagnosis. So here's a patient with an abdominal pain, maybe a six or seven centimeter mass within the liver. The liver shows mild textural change, not the most impressive for cirrhosis I've seen. There's some thickening at the GE junction. Could that be adenopathy? In fact, I couldn't really exclude a tumor. I have to admit, this lesion does not look like focal nodular hyperplasia. It does not look like a hepatic adenoma. It looks more like a primary hepatic tumor, be it a cholangiocarcinoma or hepatoma. It also could be a metastasis. It doesn't have the cystic changes of an abscess. Um, so what do you think? Well, this was a hepatoma. Now, sometimes you have hepatomas in non-serotic livers. This liver really doesn't look really cirrhotic. Probably 80% of hepatomas you're going to see, the liver is going to be cirrhotic. That can be a helpful way of distinguishing between hepatoma, perhaps, and cholangio, and perhaps metastasis. This patient has a fever. You can see a low-density cystic lesion, dome of liver. There's ascites present, maybe a little bit of adenopathy. Again, you can go through the differential diagnosis of malignancies, but when you see a cystic liver lesion and the patient's febrile, you always have to think about an abscess. Maybe the patient had diverticulitis. Maybe the patient had appendicitis recently. Maybe the patient's immunosuppressed. Maybe the patient had recent surgery. You gotta be thinking, and you don't wanna miss an abscess. Abscesses are great mimickers of primary hepatic tumors. And in this case, I can't believe it. It was lymphoma, which is why we do get biopsies. Low-density lesion in the liver. Lymphoma is something we don't think about in the liver very frequently. You can have primary lymphoma, which means it's this primary site of disease. You can have lymphoma involved secondarily. When you see lymphoma in the liver, almost invariably you'll see splenic involvement, which is far more common. You'll often see bulky adenopathy. But again, this case really is a good teaching point. You've got to go through the differential diagnosis, and at the end of the day, you may need to do a biopsy. This patient has a cystic lesion with a rim-like appearance to it. Now, I have to admit, this is really cystic, and with the history of fever, I gotta make certain I'm not missing an abscess. It doesn't look like high data disease, there's no calcifications. Amoebic abscesses are very common in the right lobe of the liver. History, did the patient have recent appendicitis or diverticulitis? Has the patient had recent surgery? Is the patient immunosuppressed? Are all things that will go through my mind. And this was an amoebic abscess. So amoebic abscesses, even in Baltimore, do occur. People do foreign travel. Uh, cystic lesion, right lobe of liver, thick rim. It's not specific for amoebic abscess, but it's something you definitely need to think about. This patient's two months post Whipple's procedure for pancreatic cancer, and this was a follow up. Obviously, the first thing you say is, oh dear, this patient now has liver mets which is one of the most common recurrent zones besides local for pancreatic cancer. Now you would say it's only two months post-op. We've seen patients, unfortunately, with negative margins recur in very short periods of time. But one thing I always tell the fellows and residents is you gotta always think about liver abscesses. Patients post Whipple's procedure can get abscesses and they may not present with an abscess. This was just a routine follow-up scan. So in this case, I'll say multiple liver lesions. Yes, I'll think about METs, but I would wanna make certain this patient doesn't have a liver abscess. And in this patient, it was multiple liver abscesses. So again, you really need to be thinking clinical history. The images sometimes, you can't get around it, will overlap specific disease processes. And I think that liver cystic lesion without a good history or with a good history, it still can be very challenging. This patient has weight loss and abdominal pain. The key thing in this case is what's going on in the spleen. Yes, we see lots of ascites, but there's patchy vascular enhancement of the spleen. 
you can get splenic enhancement with hemangiomas, hematomas, uh, things like lymphoma, metastasis typically do not enhance. But when you see patchy enhancement in the spleen, there's one thing that comes to mind to me. It's not exactly an ad mini, and you're probably not always going to be right, and it's a rare disease, but that would be angiosarcoma of the spleen. And this case was indeed angiosarcoma of the spleen. There was also liver involvement, ascites. Patchy increased enhancement in the spleen, in both liver and spleen, or even just liver, where the primary would be liver, angiosarcoma is a very good diagnosis. And here's one more image in the coronal plane showing you that. This patient has elevated liver functions, and you see a big caudate lobe. So I know we got cirrhosis, but the key thing to me is look at the pancreas. Where is the pancreas? There it is, and it's totally fatty replaced. The classic thing to give you fatty replacement of the pancreas is cystic fibrosis. Yes, you can get fatty replacement in older patients, but that's fat in between the uh, gland tissue itself that you can see. With CF, most commonly, the classic appearance is you can see where the gland is, sometimes even visualize the duct, but it's totally replaced by fat. And so in this case, the answer was cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis, not uncommonly associated with cirrhosis, and this patient had several vascular nodules, which were regenerating nodules in the liver. This patient had shortness of breath. If you look at the images, look toward the uh, right middle lobe. You can see some serpentine, these little things here, and that is very classic, those little squiggly things for AV malformation. Okay, nothing else. And this was a patient who had pulmonary AV malformations. Here it is very nicely shown in the coronal view. There's also a nice one in the right upper lobe, in addition to the lower lobe. PAVMs are most common in HHT disease, but you can get sporadic PAVMs in patients, and it's more common in women. When I look for PAVMs, particularly in HHT disease, I like to use the uh, thin MIP images with a sliding MIP. I look at axial, coronal, and sagittal plane. I also will do volume rendering, but the MIP works very nicely. This patient has acute shortness of breath. What do I see? I see adenopathy in the hyalur regions, right greater than left, and then I see infiltrates in the lung greater on the right side than the left. It's coming from the hyalur region. Obviously, one of the things you would surely have to consider here, could this patient have lymphoma with adenopathy, and could this patient have lymph angitic spread going along the vessels, particularly in the right mid-lung? That's something you need to think about. Uh, but what other things can do this? And there are inflammatory etiologies. It's not the typical appearance of TB, but it's a very good appearance for sarcoidosis. So, this lymphatic type spread extending from the hilum, adenopathy, hilar region, subcarinal zones, a very good diagnosis of sarcoidosis. This patient has hemoptysis and shortness of breath, and the history was AIDS. And yes, you could think about edema, and in this era of COVID, you can think about COVID, but it doesn't look like COVID. What gives you ground glass infiltrates bilaterally is look how the bronchi stand out. That is one of the differential diagnoses. There's certain infections in AIDS patients that are more common. Pneumocystis is the thing we think about. And this indeed was pneumocystis pneumonia in an AIDS patient. Just a very nice example. Here it is very nicely shown on the coronal view as well. This was an incidental finding and quickly you say hiatal hernia. But it's really what's the process, the two centimeter mass in the patient's left atrium? Well-defined, slightly lobular. You basically end up with two choices. Is this an atrial myxoma or could this be a thrombus? The patient doesn't have a central line in place. Um, there was no history of any procedures. Uh, atrial myxomas are not that uncommon. 
And so that would be my best bet. Atrial myxomas have a range of appearances, most commonly located between the right and left atrium by the septum. Just a very, very classic appearance. Here's a patient with a large mass in the left atrium, just abutting the right atrium at the groove. And you can see very nicely, what could this be? It could be a thrombus. That's going to be a big thrombus, but you can get big thrombus. It's very smooth. Thrombuses are more irregular. This was a, as you might guess, an atrial myxoma. I would bet large mass, left atrium most commonly. The myxomas can occur in any chamber, but the significant majority occur in the patient's left atrium. And this indeed was a large, maybe five centimeters, atrial myxoma. Here it is again very nicely on the coronal views. And with that, let me say thank you for doing a great job discussing the cases with me. Again, we always have more than two images, fortunately, or maybe we would read very quickly, but often it's certain key images that allows you to make the right diagnosis. And hopefully that's indeed the case. And I wish everybody a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.